Hello and welcome to Showcase, coming to you from our studios in Istanbul. Today, we introduce you to an extraordinary device, blurring the boundaries between music and technology even further. And we'll go to Vietnam to see how Buddhists are celebrating Vesak Day with thousands of lanterns and hours of hearty chants. But first... This, this particular time in the history of photography, uh, unlike any time before, uh, photography has been taken incredibly seriously as a, as a thing to collect. From vintage prints to the avant-garde, we've got all the outstanding pics from the UK's biggest photography fair. His work was described as an encyclopedia of Russian life. We'll take you to Moscow to visit one of the most comprehensive exhibitions ever staged, dedicated to the great Russian painter Ilya Repin. He depicted Russia during a time of upheaval through the eyes of its people, from its wealthy classes to its poorest. With expressive brush strokes and great attention to detail, 19th century painter Ilya Repin captured the nation's transformations during one of his most turbulent times, depicting everything from the hard lives of peasants to the fate of revolutionary activists. And to celebrate Rapin's 175th birthday, his masterpieces have been collected and put on display under one roof for the first time in 25 years. Moscow's new Tretyakov Gallery has opened up its vast survey of nearly 300 works by the Russian artist Ilya Repin. Born in 1844, Repin was arguably the most renowned Russian realist artist of his time. His position in the art world was comparable to that of Leo Tolstoy in literature. Both had an eye for everyday moments and skillfully captured real people and events. We've collected around 300 works here, mostly paintings and graphics. It's the first time in 25 years that such a large collection of Repin is on display in Russia. He embodied in his painting what art critics would later call an encyclopedia of Russian life. Because when you look at his paintings, you can have an idea of what happened in Russia in the 19th century, which determined the fate of Russia in the next decades. Through a series of successful but controversial paintings, where he addressed issues like extreme poverty and the Russian Revolution, Repin's works had the same influence on his generation as cinema has today. His bright and dynamic canvases look almost cinematographic, and they masterfully document the Russian society in the last years of the Tsarist rule. One such painting is Barge Haulers on the Volga. Regarded as a cornerstone work of the entire Russian genre painting, it was painted by Repin when he was a little known but promising graduate of the Imperial Academy of Arts in St. Petersburg. Repin wrote a description of these people, and he knew them by their names. The burlak leading this crowd is called Kanin, who had a very dramatic personality. The young burlak Larka, who's clearly not happy with the situation, is the only one trying to take off the strap, and in every possible way demonstrates his protest. Like author Dostoevsky, Repin was one of the leading members of an art movement called Peredvizniki, or the Wanderers who sought to portray the truth of Russian life and opposed to the restrictions of academic art. Dostoevsky was delighted that Repin had not imposed any feeling of guilt on the viewer and that he portrayed these barge haulers with interest, enthusiasm and with love. One of the biggest paintings in the exhibition is Emperor Alexander III receiving village elders in the courtyard of the Petrovsky Palace. This monumental canvas, commissioned by the Ministry of the Imperial Court, is crowned with the coat of arms of the Russian Empire and decorated with the arms of the Russian provinces. Repin's late works reveal his inexhaustible vivaciousness and never-ending enthusiasm about art. His last canvas, Hopak, the dance of the Porosian Cossacks, impresses with its emotional depth 
exhilaration and intensity captured by the 85-year-old master. The bold brushwork shows that Repin was in constant search of new ways to express himself. It's a big painting with a strong, bright, bold dance, with every dancer showing off. The dance is absolutely spontaneous, so Repin included all the elements of nature in the painting, like the flame. There are incredible color combinations with bright contrast, red, green, gold and yellow with rich blue. Sometimes he painted on the back of linoleum, which looked like a very large knit canvas, and sometimes on the front side. Here, in the clothes of these dancers in some places, Repin purposefully used a very liquid paint, leaving us to see the pattern on the linoleum, which is in harmony with the clothes in the painting. So he shows that he's able to work with any technical flaw. After Moscow, the exhibition will travel to the State Russian Museum in St. Petersburg, the Petit Palais in Paris, and the Ateneum Art Museum in Helsinki. It's year five for the British photography fair Photo London, and an interesting time in its history. It's no longer a young fair breaking new ground, but it's also not yet an institution. And yet, the consensus this year is that Photo London's offerings are more exciting than ever. Showcases Miranda Atti spoke to gallerists, photographers and the founders of the fair to find out why. Once again, London's beautiful Somerset House is chock full of photography. This is the fifth version of Photo London and it's the biggest yet, with 100 galleries all showing at least one photographer and the acclaimed Stephen Shaw taking the title of this year's Master of Photography. It's been a difficult year for the UK, with the shadow of Brexit still looming. So how does a fair like this tackle issues like that? Where you find your story most, the day-to-day -day life and politics is part of every one of our, you know, day-to-day -day life and is going to affect our life, our art scene, and of course our uh, production of art on these walls. As you walk around, you see how many of the um, artists actually touch upon um, the different era and different, you know, time. One photographer who's focusing on art that's defiantly Brexit-free is Miles Aldridge. The fashion photographer's famous for his beautiful stylized photos that have echoes of the 60s. The message I was trying to communicate was about the idea of uh, consumerism in a kind of post-pop art world. Possibly because I'm a child of that period, the 60s, that I find a sort of uh, a, a comfort and a coziness in seeing these familiar objects like uh, a, a can of soup or a... Uh, uh, a comic, uh, what have you. The work that I'm doing is sort of simultaneously kind of contemporary, but also nostalgic, sort of playing with themes and, and flavors of color that are um, about how I've experienced my life from the 60s onwards. This idea of vintage is a recurring theme at Photo London. There are plenty of black and white prints that hark back to the past. Photo London consistently showcases incredible photographers in its public programme. And this year it's the turn of the late Vivian Meyer, one of the great secret artists of the last century. An American street photographer, she spent her career nannying, yet managed to take more than 150,000 photographs, amazingly detailed observations of life in Chicago. It's also a chance for gallerists to bring a range of their artists to public attention. Behind me you'll see some photographs by Hendrik Kirstens, who's a Dutch photographer we've represented for a while. Uh, he does nothing but photograph his daughter, and he's been photographing her for 20 years, um, and always uses a different modern prop to give the illusion of Dutch, classical Dutch painting. 
Photo London 2019 offers a breadth of style, material and even time period. There are futuristic looking gems and wonderful black and white photography from the past. And on your way out, the fair leaves you with something you just can't categorise. Gavin Turk's Portrait of an Egg. Miranda Atty, TRT World, London. Along with big names like Gavin Turk, Photo London is also showcasing emerging artists who are just now coming into the limelight. Artist Rad Husak is one of them and he joins me now. Rad, thank you so much for coming on to our show. You have two series featured at Photo London. One is called Mirrored and the other one is Trace. Tell us about them, please. So those two series are a very good representation of where my practice is at the moment. The Mirrored series uh, predominantly uh, focuses on, um, on a human body, on a male body, where Trace, although focuses on the body, is abstracted version of myself. So I would say I would then divide them into self-portraiture and figurative, uh, figurative capturing of the human body. And Mirror seems like an important concept in your works. Why is that? Well, mirror, I mean, a, a short story, um, a long story short, um, the mirror was always very important to me as an object that was present around me when I was a child. Um, mirror as a reflection, mirror as a, as a conveyor of augmented reality. I mean, very, what we know now, what you see in the mirror is not necessarily what you look like or what things are, uh, what things are looking like. So. In that sense, I'm using mirror as a, as a reflector of ideas, emotions, mental states. Um, and I think putting it in the concept of, of 19th century, 20th century uh, uh, theoretical thinking you know, and the lack of an idea of, of mirror and not being able to see yourself uh, the way you are or you know, body or mind not being able to compute what it sees, so it creates a certain image to which you can relate. And your work seems pretty timeless to me, but then you're inspired by 1950s, 60s pop culture as well. How does this come at play? Very good question. I mean, um, the timelessness uh, in a sense of, uh, or in understanding of classical beauty, which is very much present in my work. And then how I link that to pop art. I mean, those, I believe those two moments in a history of art, the, the, the classics of Greece and pop culture from the 1950s really shaped uh, the present or current state of contemporary art practice. Um, we are still looking consciously or, sub or subconsciously into, into classics, into this perfect idea of body, yet what we're taking from a 50s and 60s of pop art is that you can go big, bold and brush with those ideas. It doesn't have to be any more beautifully produced, sublime. It could be edgy, it could be grungy, it could have a really real tooth of, uh, um, of textures, colours, and you go global. And I think that's what I like about uh, ideas of pop art. It's something that happened and it went viral, it went, it went big. You know, uh, you, can go to, you can go to Turkey, you can go to Germany, France, America, everywhere pop art was happening. And I think that's what really links my practice um, to those two different periods of art history. And what else are you inspired by as an artist? Oh, of course, I mean, um, very often and very rightly so, uh, uh, people connect my work to Andy Warhol's Silver Factory. As I'm using sandblasted aluminium, which uh, once is lit, creates this beautifully sparkly surface. Um, I very often go back to that reference of Double uh, Elvis by Andy Warhol, where uh, two images are superimposed on each other, create the idea of sense of movement. Um, and in that way, yeah, that, the sort of the silver surface, and again, that links us to a mirror, reflection. Although my surface sparkle, it doesn't reflect. There is an idea of something being reflected to you, something being projected at you. You also have a very unique technique, and that seems pretty central to your work, right? Absolutely. I mean, it's, I'm a process-driven artist, and uh, when someone asks me you know, where ideas and where technique sits, I think they sit side by side. Technique is as important to me as an idea. So to explain a bit more uh, about my process, um, all the art, 
all the artworks are produced or created on uh, some lacet aluminium. So um, that becomes this, this very glittery surface on which I uh, transfer images. So that what you call, what's called a pigment transfer. Uh, later, just to enhance the, the overall uh, look of the image, I add a carbon pencil, just, you know, just to create that depth and, and a rich blackness. I mean, the whole process is it's relatively simple, but it took me three years and two years at Royal College of Art um, under the guidance of Professor Joss Stockham to actually make it work, that, to make it that I can go big. And at this photo London, you will see various different uh, artworks in different uh, shapes and sizes. Um, and yeah, so I mean, it is, it is quite freeing. Once, once you master something, in this instance, my technique, it's just fantastic. You know, you can, you can, really, uh, you can really translate so many different uh, ideas onto, onto that very shiny surface. And what message are you trying to give with your art in Photo London this week? I mean, if any. I think the very simple idea, uh, the very simple message will be, um, you know, body is beautiful. Body can be beautiful. I mean, we don't have to be aware, or oh, sorry, not aware, but afraid of naked body. As, um, as your viewer will probably see, I work with male nudes, which is quite, quite uh, tricky in our society, as it is not, is it not it, sorry, it is not often talked about or looked at. Um, in that sense, I, I like to spread the idea that, you know, you can look at it and you can look at it and think that it's beautiful and it's sublime and it's something that shouldn't be, shouldn't be scary, shouldn't be taboo, it shouldn't be tucked away into a small rooms somewhere behind the curtain. But it's also the idea of joy, of joy of movement, um, joy of you know, sharing emotion and expressions. Um, yeah, I think that would be the general message I would like to, um, I would like to share with the, with the public visiting uh, Photo London. Thank you so much for joining us on Showcase today. Thank you. Still to come on Showcase, giving music a helping hand. If the glove fits, you might have a hit. As far-fetched as it sounds, we'll show you how this glove is actually changing the way musicians make electronic music. And in Vietnam, Buddhists illuminate the country's biggest pagoda for an early celebration of the Sak Day. We'll bring you those stories later in the show. But first, here is a quick look at a few other ones that we've been keeping an eye on. When it was first built, many Parisians called the Eiffel Tower a giant abomination. But 130 years later, the world is wishing it a happy birthday. Six million people flock to the icon of all things French each year. So it's only fitting that its birthday party includes a 12-minute laser show recounting the history of the tower projected onto its 324-meter-tall facade. At 80 million, you have it, sir, 80 million dollars. A stainless steel rabbit and an oil painting depicting stacks of hay made art auction history this week. The sculpture by American artist Jeff Koons, which eventually fetched 91 million dollars, set a record for the most expensive work ever sold by a living artist. Another record was broken on Tuesday, when one of the 25 paintings in Claude Monet's Haystack series sold for just under $111 million, the highest price ever paid for an Impressionist work. Black Mirror fans were glued to their small screens as Netflix unleashed a tiny taste of season 5. The trailer broke the internet after it was viewed 3 million times in 24 hours, sparking a frenzy of online speculation in continents across the world. 
helping to fill that was series showrunner Charlie Brooker, who hinted at the show adapting a lighter tone, moving away from its darker, edgier roots, something that was met with divided reactions among the fans. The dystopian anthology series returns at the beginning of June. This next story is all about helping musicians free themselves of clunky instruments or from being trapped in one spot. In London, a startup company has launched a redesigned version of the world's most advanced wearable music instrument, turning the arms and hands of performers into musical instruments. Take a look. Eight years ago, I started to develop a project that's now called the Mimi Gloves making music previously before the Mimi gloves on stage was about myself with a ton of gear constantly racing between things they may almost look like any ordinary gloves but these high-tech babies pack a punch they give musicians access to a stage full of musical equipment literally in the palm of your hand which eliminates the need for a full band if you are a solo artist. So let's get a first-hand account of how this glove works. The gloves contain sensors which measure the bend of the fingers and the orientation of the wrist. And then they have uh, electronics in them that send all of that data to a computer over Wi-Fi. Within the computer, we have algorithms that can recognize different postures via machine learning, that like a, a fist or an open hand or a one finger point, uh, or really any posture you want to teach it. And then finally, the next phase is that we have our, our software lets a musician compose their own relationship between the gesture on the one hand and the sound on the other. So they can connect their, their body to music in whichever way they want. Fusing technology and the sounds of music, the glove is giving artists a new kind of relationship with their musical tools by allowing them the chance to change how they create and perform. Putting on the gloves, it really becomes like a second skin and it becomes uh, personal to you and you can discover your own relationship just like with a guitar making shapes to make a chord on a guitar and make, make, making postures on the gloves there it's a really similar thing i'm a guitarist myself and you know, i even use the gloves with my guitar in conjunction and the purpose for the gloves is not just about what the artist creates but also about how the musician can engage center stage with the audience in a more visual and personal way. Something that was new and interesting for me is the physical relationship that I now have with music. And I immediately, when I made my first song with the gloves, I immediately knew I had to think about my physical presence on stage. And now choreography and also visualization of my music has become way more important than I could have ever imagined to be in my work. Whether you're a professional or amateur, the company hopes that these new versions of the glove are not only more cost-effective, but also their most user-friendly version to date, thus making it accessible for more musicians to try their hand at. The Mimi gloves are like any other instrument. They, they have a, a learning curve and you can put them on and within a short time you can do a few things, but you can also spend years and years getting better and better at it, developing your own style. We have different musicians with different playing styles. There's a huge amount of depth and complexity. And in a way, that's what we want to get, is a combination of immediacy and depth. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Head to our YouTube channel, for more from the world of culture and the arts. But before we wrap up our show, let's head to Vietnam, where the country's largest pagoda was ceremoniously set aflame to celebrate the father of Buddhism. I'm Ilf Thanks for watching. Bye for now.